Hello there, and it's very, very good to be with you electronically thanks to the assistance of the Humanities Lab at Lund University in southern Sweden. If TESOL is to function optimally, it needs to scrutinise carefully the terminology we use and claims made for English as a global language and the consequences that follow from what are generally myths. Myth one, international schools and universities. International schools are mushrooming in cities in many countries that do not qualify as English-speaking. There's a related growth of English medium universities in the Middle East, Asia and elsewhere. Why are both types of institution called international when the educational content is exported from the USA or the UK and when the language of instruction is the dominant national language of the USA or the UK and often delivered by monolingual teachers, professors. International, in my view, is a misnomer. The consequences are that this export business serves the interest of an elite class nationally and internationally. Local languages are given little if any support. International schools prepare for entry to universities in the US and UK and their products, the graduates, are effectively detached from local concerns and needs. Myth two, English is a global need. English is marketed as though it is universally needed by the US state in Obama's English for All project and by the parastatal British Council. Its language policy advice, David Gradol's reports, led its executive director to insist that, for instance, in India, English should be used in every classroom, home and office. And I've written about this in references which Shelley Taylor has. The consequence of this is that the advocacy ignores the local ecology, culture and languages, but provides a boost for the British and US economies and international influence. The myth is a diversion from the real needs of the world's underprivileged. Myth three. British English is necessary for development. The aid or development business was denounced by Ilo Ivan Illich half a century ago in relation to US activity throughout the Americas. But English is still marketed as a necessity for economic and social development by the British Council, an organisation which advises governments worldwide on education in general and English learning in particular. The presumptuous assumption is that the UK has the solution to local needs. The consequence is that the underdevelopment of the colonial era continues in the neo-colonial age that structurally favours the global north at the expense of the global south, the majority world. Myth four, Anglo-American textbooks are universally appropriate. Teaching materials from global publishers, Pearson, Macmillan, Routledge, Oxford University Press and so on, are assumed to have content and language that is appropriate for school systems worldwide. The 2018 annual report of Cambridge University Press states, and I quote, its education group publishes print and digital products for use in schools with strong positions in Australia, Africa, India, and in international schools, there where you have them, around the world. Our reputation for developing international best practice in pedagogy and learning skills means we also have an advisory practice helping governments and school systems with educational reform. The consequence of this myth is that it creates and consolidates new forms of imperial dependence, cultural, educational, linguistic and commercial. To the advantage of the corporate world and its shareholders and to academia in the UK and US and generally to the disadvantage of local publishers and academia. Myth five, English only in international affairs. English is proclaimed as the lingua franca of science, business, globalization, European integration, Asian integration, national unity in multilingual states, international understanding and so on. This fraudulent myth implies that no other languages serve such purposes. The consequences are that the myth privileges English in education. 
the learning of other foreign languages, whether European, Asian, African or Latin American, is hindered and proficiency in English entrenches an inequitable hierarchy in international communication at the expense of users of other languages. Myth six, all relevant scholarship is written in English. The prevalence of publication in English has led to this myth. The policies of the major academic publishers encourage the notion that only publishing in English counts. There is though a vast output of research in many languages. A recent analysis of Google Scholar documents by Cambridge academics shows that in one scientific field, 65% are in English. This is three scholars and I have the reference in the handout. In most areas of scholarship, including language education and language policy, other languages are also used. The consequence then is that knowledge generated in other, language, other languages is marginalised, which is also to the detriment of scholarship by monolingual English-using scientists. Quantifying research output and ranking systems serve to unjustly strengthen inequality between users of different languages. Myth seven, global language tests are objective and valid worldwide. The main testing instruments that emanate from the USA, TOEFL, and the UK, Australia, IELTS, are projected as culturally neutral and universally appropriate, a scientifically and morally dubious claim. The consequence is that testing is big business, but there are limitations. And I quote from a scholar called Buck, most testers have a feeling that their tests are not sufficiently accurately accurate. There's a fundamental conflict between the needs of good assessment practice on the one hand and sound financial management and good business practice on the other. And I've reviewed the anthology in question. This raises ethical problems for TESOL. My final myth eight, the internationalization of TESOL and English language teaching is apolitical. When a national professional association becomes international, as TESOL did a couple of years ago, the myth is that our professionalism is globally relevant and divorced from educational, cultural and linguistic imperialism. Whether activities are or are not imperialist needs to be analysed in any context, empirically verified. One, instrument, one instance though is that the British ELT journal, which, and I quote, is about the ways in which English is taught and learnt around the world, it has a seven person advisory board with three academics, two from publishing, Oxford University Press, and one is a British Council officer and the other from a British professional association, IATEFL. Whatever their personal qualities, and I don't doubt them, this board is a cocktail of academic, commercial and political interests. Is this compatible with academic freedom? I'll draw some brief conclusions with the help of other scholars. All eight myths seem to be alive and kicking despite some awareness of their invalidity. Ahma Babu, originally from Pakistan, there's a need for an overhaul of key assumptions made in the applied linguistics and TESOL literature. Ruani Tupas from the Philippines, now in Singapore, an exclusive focus on English medium education fails unless it's integrated within local multilingual realities. Mary Shepard Wong, I.C. Lee and Andy Go in Hong Kong, a monolingual approach to trilingual education that's needed in Hong Kong, Cantonese, Mandarin and English, is inappropriate because monolingual native speakers are limited linguistically, pedagogically and professionally. John Nag or Knag, when senior advisor to the British Council, native English speaking teachers should be increasingly multilingual, multicultural and expert. However, the book in which this comment appears reveals that such people, native English speaking teachers, generally lack these qualifications. Why are they still active worldwide? Nag provides a model of all this by saying, as an, in answer to my question, that what he's involved in is installing an appropriate linguistic model of British English for a global ELT profession, which has the goal of promoting British interests worldwide. 
It is more than likely that US language promotion worldwide has comparable goals. Is that what the globalization of English is all about? Do we wish to believe in these myths? Are the consequences ethically and professionally acceptable? And with these questions, I'll thank you for listening. Goodbye.